We want to say welcome from Fresh Start. It's another day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. You know, so often I know I say that, and uh, I know many times people wonder if I'm speaking of Scripture. Well, the Bible teaches us in the 118th Psalm, I'm going to turn to it real quick, uh, Psalm 118 And verse 24, the Bible said, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And the word is talking about the day of the Lord. That's what it's talking about. If you'll read the scriptures before and all the things that are working. But I believe that we can utilize this also in the time that we worship the Lord. He's given us another day. Here we are right at the brink of Christmas, people all coming and going and, and trying to get everything in order, but let's never forget about what Christmas is truly about. Uh, it's truly about God sending the Holy Spirit to Mary, and she conceived on this day, uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. But we'll be in John chapter 8 this morning. If you'll turn with us this morning, we'll get started uh, in the Word of God. While you turn, we'll ask Father for his blessings. Precious Father, we love you and we thank you again for this blessed day. We ask, Father, that you would open eyes and open ears this morning to your Word. Father, let land on fertile ground. Father, we love you and we thank you for everything that you do. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. John chapter 8. <clears throat> Starting at verse number 1, the Bible says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, period. The Mount of Olives is used many times in the Word of God. Many times Christ went to the Mount of Olives to stow away from the city and to get away, but again, there's so many different aspects, the discord from the Olivet Discord, meaning the, the discussion uh, of what was asked uh, on the Mount of Olives by the disciples. One of great significance, uh, chapter 24 and 25 of the book of Matthew, yeah. and it talks about that. But my mind went <clears throat> straight to Acts chapter 1 and verse 12. The Bible teaches us that I'm going to read, <clears throat> I'll read the first few verses in chapter 1 in the book of Acts. The former treaties have I made, O Theopolis, this word Theopolis is friend of God, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until, until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion, in other words, after he went through the cross, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days hence. And we know this to happen on Pentecost, uh, the 50th day after his resurrection. Six, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power as that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Beautiful concept. 
Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Twelve, this is why we came. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. So we hear we have mentioned of his descension, and it was the Mount of Olives where Christ went. Very significant place. And this uh, Sabbath day journey is right around 2,000 cubits. It was where the east gate was into the mount, where the mount came in. So it's right around 2,000 cubits. You say, well, I don't understand cubits. Well, you can take the cubits and divide it by two and come up with a yard uh, concept. So it's right about 1,000 yards from where Christ would come and go and escape from the people. But here we have... <clears throat> where Christ ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. And you say, well, okay, I understand that. What's so significant for that? Well, I like what Zechariah had to say in chapter 14. Chapter 14 in the book of Zechariah, in the first five verses, he said, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spool shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. How many of you have ever read that Jesus fought in a battle? He's talking about the first earth age. Verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon where? The Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the mist therefore, or excuse me, thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half toward the south. Verse 5, And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel, yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzzah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, all of his saints with thee. Amen. That's the part that I enjoyed reading, the latter part. Amen. I said all that to say this, that Jesus quite often would escape into the Mount of Olives. And I believe he would get his mind right, Brother Mike. He'd get his heart right and get closer to God and speak to him about things that were revealed to him and that what he was to do in times uh, to come. God would speak with him, I believe. And he had a great communication at that time, and he used the Mount of Olives. Verse number 2 in chapter 8. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. My mind goes to Ezekiel 44, where it talks about the Zadok how that they will come and they will be taught of God, of Christ. They will be taught and they will do the works. And this is very much the same concept. And often I have told you that in the book of John, I've noticed that how John lays out some things for you to attach to if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. I'm your pastor, and I'm here to do that this morning. I hope this is a help to you, and I hope you see these things. Verse number three, 
And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, verse 4, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Again, I believe that John has laid some things out. Now, some would say, now, Brother Randall, I think you're taking too much to this. I think you're adding to it, and I'm not adding to, but I want to see what your reactions are to this. This word, taken, in your Strong's is 2638, and it means to seize or overtake. To seize or overtake. And I got to thinking, Claude, well, I've read that same concept before somewhere. Where did I read that? I read it over in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. Turn with me to Matthew, chapter 24. And we'll start reading about verse 37. 37 says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. We see that so prevalent today in our time. We see so many things that are going on that people are allowing in their lives. They're allowing, well, the ways, their sexuality, just so many different ideas that the world is taking on. And it was just that same way in the days of Noah. 38, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. They were eating and drinking, but they weren't eating and drinking of the things that they should. For Jesus told us over there in chapter, I believe in 7, that uh, it might have been 6, let's see, 6. He said, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Right. He's talking about the commune at that time. And then we go into chapter 7 and it talks as if uh, to the same concept that uh, uh, he that thirst come into the water of life and drink freely. Well, here in 38, it says something else also. That they were marrying and given in marriage. I want you to pay attention to that this morning. That this marriage and giving in marriage is not always a sacred thing like you would think. These things can be very wrong in the eyes of God. And they were doing those things as they do today. Verse 39, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Amen. We know that there's a flood coming. And it's not going to be a flood of water. But in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 15, the Bible tells us in verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. This is the flood of lies. It's a flood of lies that hoping that he can catch Israel, the bride of Christ. He's hoping that he can catch this woman and secure her to himself before the true Christ comes and reveals himself. Well, we've covered that pretty well. Back in Matthew 24, the verse 40 and 41 is why I came. The Bible says, Then shall two be in the field, the one be taken and the other left. 41, two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other led. In John's gospel, chapter 8, we're talking about an adulterous woman. Amen. We're talking about a woman that was caught in the act of adultery. Let me say it that way. What the Bible's talking about here, and he uses the same word, taken. Now this word in Matthew 24, taken, is 3880, it's a different number. But it says, associate with oneself in any familiar or intimate act. So, 
if we take that to concept, my notes tell me that over here in 24 and 19, it says, but woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Right. Because they have been spiritually seduced. Amen. They have been with the wrong Christ. Yes. And they are with child at that time. They have already been sucked in uh, by the Antichrist. They Amen. have been taken and uh, they are, well, married to him now. Right. Well, we see here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you know where I'm going. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 3. It says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, what day? The day of the Lord, when Christ will come. He said, that day will not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Right. This falling away is nothing more than an apostasy. Amen. It's the time when people will change their religion, uh, yeah. what they had believed in before, and they will follow after the Antichrist. Amen. Yeah. I brought that out this morning, hoping that it would be a help to you, that this word taken uh, is exactly what the men here said that they had done to the woman that was taken in the act. Now, back in John chapter 8 and verse <coughs> number 4, Again, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. The same concept that was used in the word in Matthew 24 in an act. So you say, well, wow, that's almost kindly saying that this was put in here for you to be aware that many will fall to the wrong. Amen. Yes. And I believe that. Amen. Many will fall to the wrong Amen. Christ. They will fall to the wrong one because, well, mostly he'll come performing miracles in the sights of men, calling down fire from heaven and, and, yeah. and, and stimulus to everybody, giving out to everyone, changing policies and changing laws, and right. he'll have everybody where he wants them, right. saying peace, peace unto the world. But the thing about this is, is that they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. The problem I have with this concept is, is that there is no male factor involved in the accusation. Right. I'm going to add something that I believe. Now, this is just me. This is not biblical. This is something that I believe. I believe that it very well may have been one of the scribes or Pharisees. And they knew that he was a married man. They didn't bring him, but they brought her. They didn't know her, per se. But they brought her instead of him, with him. Now, verse 5, the Bible says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? They're trying their best to trick him up. What is said here is that Deuteronomy 22 should come to pass. That if a woman is married and she lie with another man, that she is to be stoned and the man stoned to death. And you can go on into Leviticus chapter 20 and 10. But I believe Christ was thinking along the lines of Numbers chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. Numbers chapter 5 talks about how that if a woman is found and she's not confessed of her adultery, that they will give her a test. And this test is done by the priest taking a clear glass of water and he will take the dust off of the floor right. and add it into the water yeah. 
to make it what would be called bitter water, a bitter drink. Now, it was said in that scripture, I could go over there and read it, but it's quite long. It was said in that scripture that she was to take this and they would watch her. How long do you think it would take for this to get in her system and cause a problem? Well, if the problem caused, which the Bible goes so far as say that she would be, I believe it would dry it up and that her thigh would be dried up and uh, she wouldn't be able to have children, da da da. But what Christ is seeing here is that there is no man involved in this adulterous act. And I believe that they were hiding out and they said, well, hey, he's over there in the temple. Let's just take her over there and, and let's throw out here uh, uh, that we should stone her and see if we can trick him up. So they said here in verse number five, now Moses in the law commanded us that we should, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Six, this they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him, have the reason to accuse him, you see. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Because there was no man present. There was no male factor involved in this adulterous act. Yes, right. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. He laid it out to put this condemnation on them. You want to kill her, then those without any sin, you pick up the first stone and you cast it out. And who's to say what he was writing? He could have been writing Numbers chapter 5 or he could have been writing the names of Joe or Bill or Tom and these. He said, I know where you were the other night. And I know what you were doing, and I know the things that you have stolen and that you have done. Verse 8, and again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. <laughs> the word of God has a way of doing that. Amen. Went out one by one, beginning at the eldest and even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. This eldest gives you the understanding of knowing that, hey, you should have known better. You've been in this thing long enough, you should have known better than to allow yourself to be in this position. And did he ever repent? Did he ever come to God and ask him for forgiveness? We don't know. But we do know that it convicted him, the eldest, and even unto the last, unto the least of the people. And Jesus was left alone with the woman, standing in the midst. When Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? <coughs> man is not going to condemn you in this latter day. Man is not going to bring out condemnation when one goes and runs toward the Antichrist. When one goes and believes in a rapture theory, in a false doctrine, and they believe everything that comes down the pike, no man is going to accuse you. Your accusations are going to come by the word of God. And then when Christ comes, it's going to disturb many. Many people are going to well, be awakening to the truth. Amen. He said, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What I got out of this scripture was, Friends, there is still time. Amen. There's still time to come out of this adulterous way. This adulterous thing, you say, well, uh, I, I don't see that 
believing a way or believing uh, in a rapture theory can be an adulterous way. Well, it's contrary to the Word of God. Amen. It goes against everything that God has brought out. If you read Ezekiel chapter 13, you'll find that God is very much against. Amen. If God is against it, should you not be against it? Yes. yes. Are you not a lover of the Lord? Yes. You serve Him. You worship Him. So you want to follow along as closely as possible right. and do God's will. So if we find that these people do not come out of this, they will be what we read in 24 and 19. Woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. True. Because we know that if we continue on, if the world continues on, that it's going to get even worse. Yeah. It's going to get worse to a place where people are not going to even, well, recognize the word of God. Right. They're not going to take God's word. So often we see that many places... People have changed God's word and they have conformed it to their own ideas and they've used different translations and different ideas and different commentaries and different men and it just, it becomes a mess. Right. I like what the word says. Seek ye out the old path. It's a good way. Amen. Amen. And if you yeah. seek it out and you find it, stay with it. Right. It'll help yes. you. Amen. We said all that on Matthew 24 and 19, that woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. If we look in Luke chapter 23, we see the other side of the token here. That where Jesus said, while being on the cross, during his passion, during the times he was given up, his body and his blood and his water from his stomach for the for the cause of mankind. Right. Yes. Amen. And it says here in Luke 23 and 27, he said, And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, Weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Amen. Yes. In other words, for those on down the line. Yes. He said, For behold, the days are coming in thee which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Mm -hmm. That is the opposite of of the woe that is given in Matthew 24 and 19, or Mark 13, 17, whichever one you want to read. What he's saying here is, he said, blessed are the barren. In other words, those who do not take in the Antichrist. Amen. He said, blessed are the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. In other words, they didn't give out that doctrine Amen. of the Antichrist. They did it. He said, blessed are they. Amen. He said, they shall, then shall they begin to say to the mountains fall on us and unto the hills cover us. Because they're going to know when Jesus comes back that they have worshipped or been in bed with the wrong Jesus. Amen. Jesus went away. Yes. He said, and I go away. Yeah. But I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself. Yeah. That where I am, there you may be also. Amen. Yeah. And he wanted us to be a chaste virgin. Yes. Yeah. He Amen. wanted us to stay with him. Yes. So often in the word of God, it teaches us that we are to do what? Wait upon the Lord. Amen. Wait upon the Lord. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yes. yes. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. Wait upon the Lord. But it says here, then shall they begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in a dry? Yes. That's what I got out of John chapter 8, the first few chap uh, verses there. And I hope it's been a help to you this morning. But we're going to go on. Verse number 12. <clears throat> then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, 
I am the light of the world. Amen. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Yes. After this teaching, after bringing these things out and conveying all of what John was trying to put in Scripture, I believe it should open up your eyes. I believe it should open up the eyes of the people and realize that Jesus is doing all he can to help people. Now, the Bible goes on to say that he was before he was, well, he was in the midst, was he not? He was there in the temple. He was teaching. And these men jumped right in the midst and they set her down right in the middle of them. <clears throat> well, Jesus is going back to the teaching. Now that the disturbance is gone, Jesus is going back to the teaching. Verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Here they are back. It's either them or it's some others that are just as uh, wrong in their ideas. Verse 14. Jesus answered and said unto them, Though I bear record of myself, yet my record is true. For I know whence I came, and whither I go. But you cannot tell whence I come and whither I go. Amen. In other words, you can't even see the spiritual work that I am doing. Amen. You have no idea who I am or where I come from. Amen. 15. You judge after the flesh. I judge no man. I put, at the end of that, I put, yet. <laughs> with an explanation point. He judges no man yet. 16. And yet, if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am I am the Father that sent me. Amen. He's not alone in his judgments. And he does all that he can to open the eyes of the people, to help them to see clearly what they need to see. 17, it is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. He is doing his best to show them that he is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. And that he come from Father. Amen. 19. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Jesus answered, Ye neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, you should know, Amen. or you should have known my Father also. Amen. Yes. It appears to me that these people that are calling themselves Pharisees, have no earthly idea of the Word of God. Amen. Now, they didn't have as many books as we do to sit and study from, so it would appear to me that they would have this fresh on their minds. I mean, this was their job, was it not? Right. Was it not what they were in the temple to do all yes. the time? Yes. Yes. But they're ignorant to the Word of God. Ignorance is bliss. You'll not be able to see if you stay in this condition of ignorance to the Word of God. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that to say that we need to educate ourselves to God's Word. Amen. You don't have to take what I say to be true. Take God's Word and cipher it out for yourself. Yes. Read the Word of God and see doesn't it comply to what Christ is saying. Right. Amen. 20. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, and he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. 21. Then said Jesus again to them, I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Where I go, ye cannot come. Amen. Jesus is talking to them and telling them that where I'm going, you'll never make it. You'll never make it because you'll be dead in your sins, my friend. Mm -hmm. You'll allow the world to choke you out. The same thing with the concept of reading God's Word. Don't take a man's word for it. Amen. Don't take my word for it. Right. Get in here and read it for yourself. Amen. Study along the line. Maybe the Holy Spirit will reveal to you 
what he is trying to convey in the scriptures. 22, then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he said, where I go, you cannot come. Do you see that? The only thing that was on their minds was killing. Yes. It was then either conspiring to try to kill Jesus, and then when that thought was fresh on their minds, they spoke and it came right out, did it not? Amen. They put their foot right in their mouth. Because the first thing, that will he kill himself? Because he saith, where I go, you cannot come. 23, and he said unto them, ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. Amen. Scripture teaches us that we are to be separate from the yeah. world. Yeah. Be ye a separate people. Be ye a people that God can be pleased with. Yes. Put your mind and have your conversation on heavenly things. Amen. If you do these things, right. better is your day. Amen. I can at least grant you that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Your day will be a whole lot better off if you keep your mind on the heavenly things. Amen. Keep your mind on instead of trying to work to make that almighty dollar and then just see it filter out of your hands. If you'll work and lay up treasures in heaven, yes. be a greater reward than you can ever imagine. Amen. Amen. 24, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Yeah. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. If any man come unto me, we know what Christ is talking about. If we come unto him, he will bring us before the Father. Yeah. And he will plead our case. In other words, he will be our advocate for us. He'll plead the case before the Father. Yeah. And our sins will be forgiven. How often should we do that? Oh, oh well, I did it once back in 1972. And, and that's all I need. Because <laughs> I, I, I believe once saved, always saved. Mm -hmm. That's not what the scriptures teach. Amen. That if you stay in compliance with Christ, if you are still alive on this earth, I would be willing to say there are many things that are piled up on your slate. Yeah. And that you need to repent before the Lord. Amen. As often as you possibly can. Yes. For the Bible teaches us that none are good, no, not one. For all have come short of the glory of God. Amen. We've all sinned. Amen. 25. Then say they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge you judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. Yeah. The only way that you're ever going to find peace in this life is to apply God's word to your life. Yes. It's one thing to read it and understand it, but it's another thing to apply it to your life. And do your best to live it. Amen. To live along the lines that God has laid out for us. Yes. Happy you'll be. Better off you'll be. Yes. Blessings will come your way. They understood, verse 27, they understood not that he spake to them of the Father through repentance. They didn't understand this repentable heart. They didn't understand it. They thought that actions was all. But there is a covering from our actions. We can recover our actions through Christ Jesus. Amen. And we can ask for forgiveness for the wrong things that we have done. Yes. <laughs> and to never bring them back up before the Lord again. Amen. Why? Because they are gone. Yes. Our sins will be cast out from the face of God. Amen. As far as the east is from the west. Yes. To never be brought up before you again. Yes. 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, where? On the cross. Then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. I speak 
these things. We know that everything that Christ done when he was taken, from when the soldiers came and took him, all the way to the very last day that he was on this earth, it was prophesied. Amen. Everything that he spoke on the cross was prophesied. Yes, Every word that he spoke Amen. was given to him Amen. by the Father. Amen. For it says, I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. Yeah. If you'll turn over there to Psalms 22, we'll cover a couple of things real quick. Won't stay very long in Psalms 22. For it's a whole lot of information. But the very first verse says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. First of all, he's quoting this scripture that yes. David had written down in a time of sorrow. Amen. He's quoting these scriptures because it will figure to what he is doing, but he never would have called the Father God. Right. So we know that these scriptures that he is using is prophetic, and it had to be spoke all the way down to the words that was said by the priests. Yes. Yes. Go all the way down to verse 24. It says, For he hath not despised nor arbored the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Many would like you to believe that God forsake Jesus on the cross. I declare to you that it was all prophecy, Amen. and he knew exactly what he was saying, and God never took his eye off of him. Amen. Never took his eye off of him. Amen. Oh, but he became the sin of the world. He became all the things of the world, and God couldn't look upon him because he had all this sin upon him. The scripture tells us right here, for he had not despised nor arbored the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. Him. Amen. The Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Amen. He heard his voice. So we know that he was taught of the Lord, and of all things that he done was done on the cross, it was all prophetic. Yes. Every Amen. bit of it. Yes. Amen. All the way down to the gambling of his clothing. And, and it goes on in 22. Read that. that that's a good lesson for you. Yes. You read yes. Psalms 22. Yes. It will give you understanding of all the things that went on uh, while he was on the cross. Amen. Back in John 8, verse 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Yes. Again, we have here in Psalms 22 and verse 24, I read to you, that Father never left him alone. Amen. And he said, for I do always those things that please him. Friends, this is an example for you and I. That if we will do the things that please Father, you cannot have a building big enough to hold all of the rewards that God has to give. God will repay, and he will replenish, and he will put back what man has destroyed. Amen. He'll put back all the things. Verse 30. As he spoke these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. In other words, these from Judea. Yes. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. A disciple. One who studies and disciplines themselves. A disciplined one is a disciple. Amen. Somebody that will... Stand and proclaim the word of God, even in a group that doesn't want to hear it, even in an area where it's not popular, even in a time when God's word, well, so many have read this chapter, chapter 8. 
I believe that probably all of us here have read it or heard it before. But there are mostly things here that are being taught for us to prepare ourselves for the end times. Amen. I truly believe that yes. with all my heart. Yes. Yes. Verse 32 to come to a close. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I have to declare this morning that I am a free man. Amen. I am a free man from this world. No longer am I bound down by the things of the world. So many times through my life I heard a gospel preached to me that I could not live. I didn't understand how come I kept falling, Steve. I didn't understand how come I kept making mistakes and I kept falling. I thought, well, was Christ's work on the cross not good enough for me? Was what I done and what I said not enough? For me to be whole like I wanted to be? The misconception was through the teaching of these ministers. Mm -hmm. Teaching that once saved, always saved. And that you do not commit sins. Sin no longer lays inside of it. Friend, as long as you are in the flesh, you are going to sin. Amen. You're going to have sin in your life. Yeah. And it takes through the repentance of Jesus Christ before you can ever have these things cleared. Amen. And if you'll study the word, you will be set free. Amen. I know of many today that have been set free from the bondage of the world. Amen. Yeah. Although they used the scriptures, we didn't have enough sense to realize that they were taking God's word and twisting it. Right. They were conforming it to their own ways. But I declare to you today that if you study the word of God, and you put forth that effort, God will bless you. He will use you. He will show people around you that you have something that they don't have. Amen. You have a relationship with the Father. Yeah. Amen. When you get inside God's Word, now I know we speak of that often here. This is a church that will bring out that you need to study the Word of God. Amen. Amen. This is a church that brings out what you are to study, and who you are to uh, listen to and who to not listen to. Amen. Now, if your ears are a garbage bin, then you turn on any of them and just let them just roar all they want to. You'll be more confused than you were when you come out. Right. Right. But if you'll stay with the Word of God, not me, but the Word of God, if you'll stay with God's Word and truly study it out, you won't be confounded. Amen. You will be prepared. For the coming of the Lord. Amen. You'll be prepared for that day. Right. All right. We'll pick back up next time in verse number 33. I pray this has been a help to you. I pray that uh, the Lord bless you. We have our uh, holidays coming, and we know that Christmas is uh, just uh, right around the corner, uh, a couple of few days. And so we pray that the Lord richly bless you, and that you have a very Merry Christmas, and may God bless. We want to say welcome from Fresh Start this morning. Uh, we are not in our building this morning due to conditions of the weather, but we are here in our own home, and uh, we want to welcome you in this morning in this Bible study hour uh, that the Lord richly bless. Um, we're going to be back in John chapter 8 this morning, finishing up John chapter 8. This will be the second half of John 8, and if you would... Grab your Bibles and, and turn with me this morning, John chapter 8, and we'll get started. And before we do, we'll ask Father for his blessings. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would open ears and open eyes this morning, Lord, to your word. Allow your word to fall on fertile ground this morning, Father, and how we so much need your word this day. Father, again, we thank you for all that you do. Lead God and direct us, Father, and we'll praise you. And thank you for all things. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Last week, we began in John chapter 8. And I'd like to highlight just a little bit of some things that uh, we had talked about. Um, in the beginning of John chapter 8, we see that there was a woman taken uh, in the act of adultery. And uh, we want to be sure to emphasize how John teaches 
along the lines of things that you spiritually should be able to see, uh, those who have eyes to see. The woman in verse number three, it says that, and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. This woman is representing Israel today. It's a sad state of mind to think that our loved ones and our friends and our families are being misled through teachings uh, unlike these, but they are being misled and it will lead into an adulterous generation. He said in verse 4, in they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And we recalled how that Matthew 24 spoke also about this same word taken. And in chapter 24 of Matthew, uh, at verse 40, Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken and the other left. I want to emphasize this morning that many denominations like to teach that this one taken is the blessed. But I want to declare to you, as we go down to verse 41, it says, Two women shall be grinding at the meal, the one shall be taken and the other left. We brought out how that this word taken is in the Hebrew 3880 in your Strong's and that it associates with oneself in any familiar or intimate act. So we see that this is not a blessing to be taken first. For these that are taken are taken out of season. And that's what Christ is trying to teach in Matthew 24. But as we start out in John chapter 8, in the second part of this study, I want to declare to you that these people that Christ is speaking to, these Pharisees and Sadducees, these are the scribes, he's talking to the Kenites. These are Satan's children that have taken over and have taken the place that God's people should be in. And um, it's a terrible thing to see, but God had made a way for us, even down to this generation, to come to the knowledge of the truth. And I thank him for that this morning. I myself would have been as lost as many of these people, but through God's blessings and through determination and through the work, God has seen fit to open the eyes and to open the eyes of many people like yourself. And I thank the Lord for that this morning. We'll start in John 8. We'll start about verse uh, 28. The Bible says, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then ye shall know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me. I speak these things. We brought out last week that when he is lifted up, we know that this is when he is on the cross. Many will come to thee, understanding once that he has passed and the work on the cross is done. Many standing around and witnessing will come to the view of the understanding. And we know that Christ spoke of Psalms 22 when he spoke the words that he spoke on the cross. And verse 29, and he that sent me is with me. The father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. This should be an example for you and I. We should always try to do the things that please the Father. Have you pleased the Lord lately? Have you told him how much you love him? How much you're thankful of your security and your safety and your health at this time? We know that living in this earth is not the final destination. We know that in the flesh that we will give up the flesh and that we will be with the Father. 
We will be with the Lord for a thousand years as he teaches. But the word says here, Father hath not left me alone. In Psalms 24, or excuse me, Psalms 22, verse number 24, he declares as he has spoken, For he hath not despised nor arbored the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But he cried unto him, and he heard. Many would like you to believe that God forsake our Savior on the cross. They do that out of ignorance because they do not read the scriptures. They do not study along the lines of what the scriptures are teaching. What Christ said on the cross was quoting Psalms 22. Back in 8, verse 30, As he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus unto those Jews uh, which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. A disciplined one. You are one who studies his word and not only reads it, but lives it. This is a reality that we're living in. This is not just a book that we're reading. This is not just a bunch of scriptures that we have put together, but this is reality. And reality is, is that Christ has you in his best interest. Verse 33. Excuse me, I'll back up to 32. I missed 32. And as you shall know the truth, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm so glad today that we are in this latter generation. I'm glad to know that we are in the latter days. Because the word teaches us that he will open the minds of the people. He will open the hearts and he will speak to his elect, to God's chosen. And had it not been in this day, I don't believe that very few of us would have come to the knowledge of the truth and be set free. There's something to be said about being free. Free from condemnation, free from this world of sin, free from the bondage of men. Man would like to set your mind and tell you what you are to believe and tell you what you are to study and and what to read and what not to read. But I declare to you this morning that if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you believe in his words, then you are free. You're free indeed. No man can place bondage upon you for you have what the Bible says is a seal in your mind. It is sealed with the seal of God. In times past, when the king would give out a decree or a letter, he would take his ring and he would put the signia in wax and he would place it upon a seal. And that seal would not to be opened or to be touched until it was delivered properly to where it goes. The same today with the word of God. God's word is sealed in your mind for a reason. He's going to need you in this near future to carry out his work and to do the will of him. And the scriptures teach us that we're not to rehearse what it is that we are to say in that day, but we are to be led by the spirit of God. When God's spirit leads you, you're directed correctly and that seal will be opened and be used by the Holy Spirit of God. And the things that you will say will be directed by God. What a glorious time that's going to be. What a glorious time it'll be to be a witness for our Savior. Verse 30. And he spake these words. Many believed on him. Then said he unto the Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's important to be free. 
There's nothing worse than studying under somebody and not feeling free. Studying under the conditions of someone's teachings and not be free. I encourage you to read God's Word and to study along your own way. Use this as a study guide. But friends, if God delivers something to you and places it in your heart and your mind, it's for you. And God will bless you and use you. 33. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and we never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? I've got a problem with that scripture, and I believe John is trying to tell us something. He's showing us what the Kenites had said. They said they had never been in bondage. I remember in the word of God that where God's people were in bondage for 400 years, and they say they're not in bondage, or never have been in bondage. 34, and Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You can become a slave to sin. Sin can rule your life. But through the acceptance of Jesus Christ, that desire for that sin will fade away. It will take a while for some. It'll take studying and staying in line with the Lord, in line with His Word, staying true to His Word and being a doer and not a hearer only. Then, and then only, shall you become free. 35. <clears throat> And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. How true it is. He is the son, and he will abide forever. 36. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. My freedom came when I accepted Christ as my Savior. And then I began to grow in freedom as I studied the Word of God, and as I placed it in my life and allowed God to form me and to make me what I am today, uh, I have a desire to please the Lord. My desire is not to please man, not to please a government, not to please this world, but to please our Father. And there's a lot of work to be done still. 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. It appears that when you began to speak truths to those in the world today, it appears that some have a desire that they would just like to kill you. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the truth. But, but because the Lord has placed it in your heart, you have to speak it. You have to give it. You have to be that one who places it and spreads the seed. It's not always a glamorous thing to be a child of God in the eyes of people. You today know what it means to be a child of God. You today know what it means to be in favor with the Lord. When you're not in favor with God, things are hard. Things get hard in a person's life. And if you're not careful, you can choose some bad choices that can be very detrimental. But as we stay in God's Word and we listen to what his word teaches, then we can come to the understanding that he is trying his best to direct you and I. 38, he said, I speak that which I have seen of my father. 
I speak that which I have seen with my Father, and you do that which you have seen with your Father. Jesus is speaking today about two different fathers. Have you ever heard that there are two fathers? Have you ever studied along the lines that there are two fathers? It's important that you have this in your studies, that you understand that there are two fathers. Verse 39, They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. 40, But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. He is told the words that need to be told at this time. He spoke the words that is for you and I to grow and to learn and to study. But he says here, but now you seek to kill me. We know that anyone that seeks to do any killing whatsoever, they are associated with the Kenites. For God's children do not kill. We do not go out and just take somebody and destroy them because we don't like them. The Bible says that we are to judge no man before his time. Which time is that, Brother Randall? It's the time when Christ comes. We know not what time that a man can change his heart. These who have a father other than ours, they can come to the knowledge of the truth. They can accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they can become a child of the King. But it takes belief in God. Belief in Jesus Christ and the works that he done on the cross. Verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. 42. Jesus saith unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceed forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. He was sent by God. And he performed every duty that he was to do to the letter. He done exactly as Father had instructed him to do. Forty-three, why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? They do not have the ears to hear. They do not understand what Christ is speaking. Speaking in a spiritual sense can throw a lot of people off. It can get them to think that you're talking about things of this world. Many times... I catch myself speaking spiritually and it might go over the head of some people. And that's understandable because many don't understand the word of God. They don't see that how it is speaking spiritually. Verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil. This is the other father that I'm speaking of. And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abideth not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. There are two fathers. And there are two types of people in this world. There are those that believe in Yahweh, and then there are those who like to follow after Satan. We know that 
Christ had taught in Matthew chapter 13. If you'll turn with me to Matthew 13, I want to highlight a thing here that Christ has spoke. Verse 34. Jesus said, And all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. You'll find this in Psalm 78, verse 2. I will utter things which I have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went to the house. And his disciples came unto him and saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. This is Christ. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. And the tares are the children of the wicked one. This word seed in verse 38. In your Greek, Strong's, it's the numbers 4690. Unlike what you would believe, this word seed, it means male sperm. It's called sperma in the Greek. He's speaking of the offspring from a man. So again, he said, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are the angels. 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. When? At the millennial. In the millennial reign of Christ, at the end of it, at the great white throne judgment of God, is when these things will come to pass. So he says back here in 8 verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lest of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. We, as children of God, we must teach who these Kenites are. We must be aware of their actions. We must be aware of their lies and their deception. As we read in Revelations chapter 2, in verse number 9, we read that there is a church that the Lord is very pleased with. He said in Revelations 2 and 9, he said, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. He's speaking about those that have associated themselves with our brother Judah. They've pretty well taken over. And we see how that they are showing themselves in this latter day. We see how they are monopolizing the world. They hold the key to the four hidden dynasties. These four hidden dynasties are the economics and the politics, the education and religion. They hold all four, and they are in control very much today. He's talking about 
the church of Smyrna, which is the church that teaches who the Kenites are. But also in chapter 3 and verse 9, he speaks to another church. This is the church of Philadelphia. He said, Behold, I will make them the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews. They say they are of our brother Judah, but they're not. And are not, but do lie. Why do they lie? Because they are of their father, who is the liar. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Be sure and don't get the big head on this and think that people are going to come and worship you. You are going to be at the feet of Jesus. That's where they're going to come and worship. On that day, the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. We know that these are Satan's children. Back in 8 and 44, he said, he was a murderer from the beginning and abideth not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. That's who we're talking about this morning. This chapter 8 in the book of John had a lot of controversy when it was canonized. Many did not want it inserted in the book of John. And you can see why today. You can see why because it really brings out who these children are. Verse 45. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Isn't it like we're getting just a little bit of what Jesus got a whole lot of? When we try to tell our friends and our loved ones the truth, Many turn us off. Many do not want to hear. Many have their own ideas. 46. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. I pray this morning that you understand the word of God on your own. And if not, continue to study. Continue to stay in the word of God. There's coming a time when many will not understand. I'm going to go to Matthew 25 for a moment and speak about the ten virgins. Matthew 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. This oil is representative of the word of God. How much knowledge do you have in your lamp today? How much wisdom do you have to be able to stand against the whales of the devil in that day? For, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. You as wise today, you keep this word of God. Let me say to you this morning that it's not just a one-time study. It's an everyday refresher of the word of God. If you do not keep refreshed in the word of God, it can very easily just leave your mind. You can be brought down by the cares of the world. You can more or less be kind of like Peter was when he walked on the waters and the waves came up and took his attention off the Lord. Do not allow the distress of the world to take your attention off the word of God. God's word is placed together for a reason and it's to help you and to warn you in this day. Five, he said, the bridegroom tarry and they all slept and slumbered. Six, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. This is when? 
This is at the last trump. This is not something that will happen prior to the coming of the Lord. This is not something that Christ is going to make a, a step in and take some and leave others behind. It's not going to work that way, my friends. Those lies are really of no use any longer. They don't have very much power this day. We see as we are entering in to the latter part of the fifth trump, we see that distress is coming on this nation and trouble is coming. I ask you today, those that may believe in the rapture theory, where is the promise of your rapture today? Are you not going through the distress of the world? Verse 7, And all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, The foolish, these that who were set on what they thought they believed, on the traditions of man, sitting in the house of the Lord for many years, listening to a one-verse Charlie, somebody that will not teach them the word of God. These are those that go out of the house of the Lord more confused than they were when they came in. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. They didn't have enough understanding of the word of God to know to wait upon the true Lord, to wait upon Christ. They didn't understand that Christ came at the last trump. They believed that one that was standing where he ought not. They believed the prophecies that was given in Daniel. They believed him because he was able to call down fire from heaven. And he handed out money and stimulus to every person in the world that would honor him. Verse 9 is why I came. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. We know that the Kenites, they, in the earlier part of Genesis, we read that they cannot till the ground and grow any longer. They cannot do for themselves. So they have became the merchants of this world. These Kenites is who the bridegroom or the, the, uh, the uh, virgins have said that you should go and to buy. I like the way that the Lord brought this out. In other words, you've been listening to the Kenites all this time and you never gave any time to the Lord. You have listened to the words of the Kenites all of your life and you have not given time to the Lord to study. I said all of that to say this, that it takes a lifetime to study the Word of God. It takes a lifetime to be able to gain as much as you possibly can from God's Word. Back in John chapter 8, verse 46. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Question. Christ is asking you this question this morning. Why do you stumble on the word of God? Why do you stumble when Christ speaks? Take and use this time to study out God's word. He that is of God heareth God's words. Therefore, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Do not be the foolish virgins in Matthew 25. Do not be these that do not understand. Find your place in the word of God. Find yourself in studies. It's the greatest thing that you will ever accomplish in this world is coming to know the truth. Many would say, well, putting education in, and, and bettering myself in my job and, and, and putting up things for my family, these are good for the flesh. But friends, I'm talking spiritual this morning. I'm talking about the things that will help you in this life to come. 48, 
Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? In our earlier studies, we seen where Christ had went to this little Samaritan woman. And we seen how confused she was because of traditions that she had lived in. And Christ seemed fit to try to help her. But these Jews were associating him with a Samaritan, somebody who has no desire to worship God and has a devil. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father. And you do dishonor me. 50. And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Who is this? It's God. God does the judging. Father will judge every soul. And he is a righteous judge. 51. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. I want you to understand what he's talking about here. Hebrews chapter 2 gives us the understanding. In verse number 14, Hebrews 2 and 14 for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He did. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You do not need to worry about death. He's speaking about where he conquered death, hell, and the grave. Where he was triumphant over the works of Satan. Many believe that this scripture would be saying that they'll never see death. But he's talking about how that if you put your faith in Christ that Satan will have no power over you. 52. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? Jesus said in verse 54, if I honor myself, I honor my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. 55. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him, I shall be a liar. If I say I shall not know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. I like how Christ called him out on this one. He pretty much called him a liar. Verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Now they're really confused. Now they have no understanding what he's talking about. But if we look over in Hebrews chapter 7, turn with me to Hebrews 7 and 1. Hebrews 7 and 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave it the tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Three, without father, without mother, 
without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. The Word says that in verse 3, without father and without mother, without descent. He did not get sent in at this time. He was Melchizedek, Jesus Christ. I want you to take and turn with me to Genesis chapter 14 this morning. We're going to take just a moment and we're going to find some truths here in Genesis 14. Pretty much covering exactly what was said in Hebrews chapter 7. But we'll start about verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, And of the kings that were with him, at the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. In the Hebrew, this priest is Elyon. Elyon is the dispenser of God's blessings in this earth. The blessings proceed from a priest who is a king upon his throne. And as we read through, we see he was the priest of the Most High God. This is El Elyon, the Most High God. This is the highest God of all gods. We see through paganism that there were many small G.O.D.s, but this is the Most High God. 19, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. This was Christ that he was speaking of to the Kenites. He was proclaiming that in verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And he truly was glad. Verse 57. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. How and hast thou seen Abraham? Question. Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. The sacred name. Verse 59, to come to a close. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. God had his hand of protection upon the Lord. And it wasn't his time to be taken by the Kenites. It wasn't his time to go to the cross yet. This chapter 8 is a great refresher for those who are studying along the lines of who the Kenites are. It's important that you know today who these Kenites are. Who control this world today. But if you stay close to the Lord in His Word, you stay in His Word every day, it will refresh your mind and bring joy to your life and peace. There'll be no worries. As we see the world today, it's upside down. There is a lot of things that are circulating through the news and circulating through conversation 
and people are wondering. Many are wringing their hands. Many are scared and afraid of getting out of their homes and associating one with another. I declare to you this morning, if the Lord Jesus Christ had set you free, then friends, you are free indeed. I pray that you continue to study the Word of God. Pray for us at the little church. Pray that the Lord continue to bless. We pray that next week we'll be back in our church. But until next time, may the Lord richly bless you. Amen.